websites in a network that I publish to uh, probably five or six times a week so I'm very much interested in uh, getting my message out there what I wanted to talk to, to talk to you tonight about was um, something called uh, sacred see we're gonna get to God after all <laughs> <laughs> right. and what I want to do is uh, sort of reverse engineer my model of the sacred for permaculture and develop it uh, in, a, in a reverse way, starting in, in a certain stages here. And I'll let you know what these are now, just so you know what's coming. Mm -hmm. Permaculture is this corner, mm -hmm. which is also sustainability. If you don't know what oh. permaculture could be, it's similar. Mm -hmm. That's what the S's are. Myth is here, uh, stories, myth, same sort of thing. Alchemy is on this corner. Al Alchemy. And, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, the S is uh, something I'll tell you later. <laughs> so what I'd like to do in stage one of the discussion is have you uh, give me some ideas of what is sacred to you without any reference to the model or any references at all. Just tell me how you see the sacred in our world. And I'll just go around the, go around the block here. What is sacred to you, sir? Um, sacred to me is the natural world, all the living beings that are, you know, including humans, but definitely including all the other beings that are human, and also the natural ecosystems, the water, the air, you know, the beauty that's out there is sacred to me as well. Also some of the um, cultures, uh, the indigenous cultures and some of their ways that are also kind of being wiped out. That to me, there's some amazing wisdom in indigenous cultures that is sacred to me. Okay, so wisdom, culture, sacred. We're already starting to form uh, something more concrete than just sacred, which is good. I'm, ha I'm happy. And what, what's sacred to you? Uh, I think Rich covered a lot of what is sacred to me already. Um, perhaps I would add for my own self the flow between the flow in creation, that which is, you know, moving all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the sense of the holy comes sometimes when you are feeling a part of uh, something much greater than your own ego, when you're lost in something that just, it just takes you, you know, aha. And that's sacred to me. That's a holy moment. Cool. Thanks. I keep going back to Mircea Eliot, the sociologist who uh, talked about uh, primitive cultures who had uh, uh, the good silverware is brought out when uh, really important guests come and the ordinary silverware that everybody eats off of is, is back in the kitchen someplace and the sacred things are, the sacred things, one of the concepts of sacred is uh, those things that are special. So say for special occasions, uh -huh. and they have their at a higher level of consciousness than the ordinary eating uh, tools. You so you're talking about ceremonies, ritual? Is that what? Yeah, you're that I don't know that that's what I would answer. This is this is what's sacred to me, mm -hmm. except I early on did a study of trying to figure out what sacred was, and that's one of the things that I've led to with Mircea mm -hmm. Iliad and his uh, discussion of. Uh, sacred and what the sacred is. It's things that are set aside specially in a special category. Like if you go to somebody's funeral, why then it's, it's essentially sacred that, that comes. And uh, anyway. 
That sounds really good. Thanks. Mm. Bill, what do you think? Uh, well, actually, I'm finding it hard to answer. I guess it's a term that I really don't use much. You know, what comes to mind is um, kind of the system as a whole, the cosmos. Or, um, mm. Yeah. Do you have, uh, do you have uh, as a counterpoint, some religious uh, well, experience that we would say wasn't sacred? Well, actually, that's probably why I'm the reason I have trouble with it. I have a lot of, not, uh, not fundamentalist, but pretty conservative Christian background that I've kind of left behind. And mm -hmm. So maybe I'm a little reluctant to think in those terms anymore. Recovering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A recovering fundamentalist. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I guess what I was driving at was um, in that vacuum where we where we determine what isn't sacred, we don't have anything to show for it, so we're lost in a yeah. sense. So that's my thinking about not having something sacred, but mm -hmm. what isn't. See, it's interesting. That's part of what we're doing now. Sir, what do you got? Well, I was about to say what some what many of the others have said, till you just said, you know, what is not sacred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I was about to say everything, all that is, and how it works, or how we think it works, or how it really works, is sacred. It's blessed, if you will. I think that's what sacred means. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then, what is not sacred? If all that is is sacred, what is not sacred? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I think about that one. All right, let's ruminate, ruminate on that. Yeah. We'll try and get a first round in and see where we go. Man, what do you think? Well, I was thinking that basically all life is sacred. What about um, rocks and dirt? Yes, I include lows in life. Okay. Good. Um, so the earth, the earth, the universe, all, all, all living things, whatever form or shape they take, and I think pure, um, and I'd have to define pure, but pure love mm. is sacred. Mm. Mm -hmm. Pure love. Yes, or the divine love. Mm, wow. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. You want to come with me? I'll put you a bit. Sure. Yeah. 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 Most of it's already been said. I mean, plus, I, I have a reverence for uh, nature and for life, I mean, which has been said. And also the quest for meaning and purpose in existence. I think the. Uh, that, that is sacred to me. Mm. Just okay. ex through the exploration of consciousness, I think that's about the best way to, uh, to get where I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you like music? Certain yes. types of music, yeah, yes. certain things. When you listen, when I listen to Mahler sometimes, I just have to tell you, that's a sacred place. <laughs> and some of the others, too. Some of the feedback I've gotten on LinkedIn, for instance, when I posted this question, they've talked about the soul as sacred. So what's the soul? Who can tell me what the soul is? Where can I find one? You can't see it. I mean, I mean it's, it's supposed to be that divine spark within, okay. or our connection with the divine, direct connection. So you can find it within yourself. Right on. So we are divine. Some philosophers. There's a question of what is divine. Keep splitting hairs. Yes. <laughs> okay, folks. Well, let's oh, look up. Too. Let's keep those initial reactions in mind. The A actually stands for alchemy. And I've defined alchemy in new ways. It's no longer turning something into gold, it's a transmutation process. And I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, promote new alchemy because I think it's going to fill some of the gap that you talked about hmm. when we don't know what we don't have or what the opposite of sacred is. Um, alchemy to me is, is very uh, very much a spiritual glue. Hmm. So uh, rather than you know give this all away, uh, let's talk about your ideas about alchemy. I'd be very interested and tie it to sacred if you could. Let's go reverse. What do you think alchemy is as a transmutational process? Well, it, it's um, it was sort of an underground <laughs> that uh, for people who uh, wanted to discuss spiritual matters and uh, <clears throat> uh, matters of the psyche and uh, 
They, I think a lot of the alchemists were the early psychologists. Mm. Really, because most people would say the early alchemists were just metallurgists trying to well, yeah, change I, stuff into gold. Yeah. But you're, you're talking about a different class of alchemists. Yeah, well, I think that was the shield <laughs> ah. that they hid behind. So they had magic. Alchemy was also magical. Then. Is that right? I, alchemy was magical? Yeah. Back in the... 13, 1400s. I mean, the term that's generally accepted as alchemy? Back then, yes. <laughs> yeah. Changing a, a substance into a, yeah. a higher substance, yeah. like a rock mm -hmm. and a gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was magic. Or, mm -hmm. or the alchemy of spirit, changing hopelessness into sacredness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's more or less what I'm driving at here tonight. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All right. You look like an alchemist. <laughs> I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I say also. Set her up. <laughs> you don't want she know. is one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a therapist. You ever thought about it? <laughs> so what do you think? What's alchemy to you? I'd just be interested in that question alone. Well, interestingly enough, I, the first thought that came to my mind was magic. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. It was. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very nice. But I didn't think of it as, as, as I mean, I, I think of it as a transformation process. Mm -hmm. But I also thought of it, I had a darkness associated with it too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, kind of a misuse at, at times, witches and the occult, and the occult yeah. kind of stuff. Great. Oh. That's very interesting. Okay. Very nice. Sir? Well, yeah, it has that connotation of the occult and mysterious and <coughs> secret society and, and that sort of thing. That's the connotation from the 1300s, I would say. Yeah. But if you try to think of what it does, I guess um, uh, changing the nature of something. Right. From what something to something else. Changing the nature of something. So, to jump slightly ahead of it. So it's even more than a metamorphosis. It's changing it the is changing. Oh. So, I'm going to argue soon that permaculture is very much a part of an alchemic process. Not only on a spiritual level, but a soil level. Or community level, that's that's you know I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's mm -hmm. exactly my point. Change your nature, or something. right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, I guess I'm two for two here. It's also not a concept that I looked into much in depth, so I just kind of have the superficial understanding of it. Although I suspect there are many more layers to it than I realize. Because I think I saw Isaac Newton was an yeah, alchemist as well, wasn't he? And, so I'm sure there's more substance to it than simple uh, get rich <laughs> or mm. Well, one of the things I'm working on is soil, or not soil, sound alchemy. Mm. And uh, what, does that, what does that mean to you, if anything? Sound alchemy? Sound alchemy? Or sonic alchemy? Does, um, that, does it touch any nerve or no? No, unless it's trying to use sound in order to affect uh, the state of something else. Right, well she said music. And so yeah. that's the same, the same thing. Music is an alchemic process to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. Alchemy uh, is like a catalyst. The catalyst is the chemical that you add to something that totally changes the composition, the molecular structure, and maybe more of the stuff that's in the bottle. And so when uh, someone comes in and uh, tips the balance, the tipping point, that's the person who actually, whether it's a Churchill or a Lincoln or uh, doesn't have to be a political figure, anyone who really senses uh, what it would take to uh, tip the balance towards a real step forward, mm -hmm. that person is actually an alchemist. A good preacher can do that, or a good <coughs> priest uh, can take air that's uh, ordinary and change it into something that's just magic. Magic. <laughs> Good. We're getting consensus. You guys, you know, said it. Um, I guess one thing that I was thinking of is the ancient mass of turning the, uh, what is it, a lot of, what does the priest do? I can't even remember. Oh, Something into wine, yeah. um, into the blood of Christ, the oh, wine into the blood. So 
in a sense, I think that alchemy involves sacrifice, that it's the, the death of one substance for the creation of another substance. It, it, it's almost mm -hmm. like it's embedded in our psyche that we have this, um, you know, you talk about the dark side, but there's that mm -hmm. something has to die for something mm -hmm. to change. Mm -hmm. So. That, very interesting. That's just what is that a Judeo-Christian thought, or is that me I, just I don't know. It just kind of. I don't know where it came from. But I've heard that too. In order for there oh, to yeah. be creation, there has to be destruction. Oh, well, yeah. it's sort of true in nature. Yeah. It's not Judeo-Christian. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The seed that uh, has got to die in order to become a plant that uh, is a Christian uh, tradition. But it's everything. Unless the seed is broken and dies. And put into the ground, then it can't grow a new plant. That's Isn't that uh, also in the Hin Hindu uh, tradition? I mean, they have the God be a creator, destroyer. Vishnu, and the, Shiva, oh, yeah. yeah. Vishnu. Yeah. 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 One has to destroy the maintainer, the one who maintains. Yeah. There have to be fires in the forest, right? When they controlled it, it, it didn't work. Right. Yeah. The lightning, so the the lightning life does its yeah. job. Yes, release the seeds. That's a good, good point. Okay, what do you think, alchemy? So, I think alchemy is, in general, a process for transmuting um, something from one state, from a lower state to a higher state, with a conscious intention, conscious human intention. So metamorphosis is not driven by a human intention, and it's like one state to another, but one's not necessarily higher, it's just different. But in alchemy, you're taking a base metal to gold, or you're taking like dark to light. And so I think of what you guys were alluding to is, let's say you're working on a healing level, um, and this could be sonic as well. Um, and you might use, uh, like that's my understanding of one of the main purposes of Stonehenge was, you know, they've measured it. and. If you have a shaman doing a ceremony with drumming in a certain spot there, everything gets amplified and it creates this sonic field that shifts the consciousness of everyone in it into the state where it's kind of the trance healing mode. Mm -hmm. And so that can shift lower base emotions, let's say there's grief or pain or, yes. you know, into joy, you know, that can be a transmutation of a lower to a higher as viewed through the com uh, through you know human eyes, like we see it as lower to higher, so that's what I think of it as, and then you can apply that to like whatever you want to transmute. The right. process is general. That's great. Okay, oh. very interesting. Did you have something? something no, I was just thinking you say about the Buddhist monks do that too. They always say well, yeah. the chanting, the so chanting, chanting, chanting right. yeah. sound and all of that. Could I just give a plug for a healing uh, drum circle that meets uh, <laughs> sure. on Sunday? Uh, this is an ad. Go ahead. Yeah, right, this is a commercial. <laughs> 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 It's amazing. We we met about three times, and the one time six people there had cancer, and a lot of anxiety and pain and stress. And by the time we finished drumming for two hours, you could sh you could taste the palpable difference in the whole group. Mm -hmm. The energy was then serene and balanced and wonderful. And it's because in drumming you you get the sound pulls you into a unity that is so powerful. So. Sonic alchemy. Yeah, so if you're interested in a drum circle, Mo, who comes to Noetics. I've got some t-shirts in my car. So yeah. Mo, okay. you know where she is. <laughs> you know Mo, she lives right uh, yeah. here. Mo Weimer. Yeah. 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 So. I was like, every Sunday? Yes, no, it's once a month. Okay, um, I'm actually heading towards home here. I, I promised myself that I wouldn't belabor this model of building. But what I wanted to do is look at uh, another another corner of the sacred triangle, if you will, and talk about mythology. Because um, if we agree that permaculture, in, in a sense, is about sustainability or about nature, about gardening, you know, there's a lot of metaphors about permaculture. We can talk more about that. But my concern is, where are we going to get new myths and how are we going to construct them? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of the old myths are basically fizzled out. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not somebody who reads Greek mythology. I've written new myths based on permaculture and alchemy. <laughs> you can find those on my website. But I wanted to find out your, your views of how myth, new myth perhaps, relates to the, the sacred. 
how that resonates, if it does at all. Bill, let's start with you. Give you a chance to go first. Okay. What do you think of this relationship here? Well, I guess my understanding of it is that sacred is usually beyond normal description and conception, so it has to be approached indirectly. And I guess historically, the way that it's been done is being by being illustrated through myths. Interesting. Can you give us an example? No, well, just one that pops to mind is the, some of the Greek mythology, like the Odyssey, and um, you know, I suppose the biblical parables. Or, mm -hmm. Interesting. So mythology, whether it's old or new, is is a channel for sacred. Yeah, I it's a it's a vessel for sacred. It's way to how you see it. It's sort of like art and poetry too. I guess it yeah. kind of evokes a sense of something without being able to approach it directly. Okay, that's very cool. <clears throat> what do you think about myth nowadays? Well, I think myth is story. Yeah, and yeah. story yeah. and sacred is mystery. Not just mystery. Sacred is an understanding or a feeling about all that is and all that is that we don't know, you know, the not knowingness of all that is as well. So it's part of the story to help explain what we see, explain all that is, explain uh, what we don't understand about all that is, the mystery. And the myth is a story. And so story is a way to reach uh, the, the consciousness, the subconsciousness, the unconscious, if you will, with those understandings, by telling those stories. Uh, and I think saying the myths are becoming obsolete is because, you know, they're trying to explain the mystery, and as the mystery is pushed back for our, through our scientific understandings and whatever, yeah. then we need different explanations that still fit with, with the evidence, but still explain what's left of the mystery, okay. if you will, or the apparent. So is the mystery always the same all no. throughout the ages? You're saying the mystery changes. The mystery right. changes because we, we, we know more. We think we know more. Maybe we really don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's an illusion. You yeah. know. Well, it's like divine. Isn't the divine the same thing throughout the ages? And can, you know, isn't mystery mystery? I'm trying to you know, get more out of you, sir. What do you think? Well, the stories, the stories explain what we see and how it came about. And what it means, and um, the myth is those stories in a way that we can understand it um, in, in the unconscious or the irrational mind, if you will, the soul, okay. the soul level. Uh, when I say the mystery, I'm saying what it is that we have questions about. Ah, questions, yes. That's what I mean by mystery. Yeah. Good. And so, our questions are changing as we find out different things through, through science or whatever, you know, uh, through experience, through science. Those questions are changing. So okay. we need this to help answer those questions. Or at least present them so we can talk about them. Yeah, well, that. Or experience yeah. the mystery mm -hmm. anew. Yeah. Okay. That's very good. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I was thinking of myth too. The first thing that came to mind, of course, was the Greek the myths and the Odyssey and all of those. As I'm listening to all of this, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking about sacred, and I'm thinking about myth, and then I'm thinking, what are the, I don't know what the new myths are, but what are we living with today? Is it a myth that there could be peace on earth? No. <laughs> well, you say no. I don't know. I mean, I, but maybe it, I think sacredness would be peace, and peace on earth, and that would be sacred. No, is it a is is a myth? Not only a story, but it is a kind of a, of, a, of an overall belief yeah. system. Yeah, I would say that. And I think in this today, some of those, and maybe that wasn't one of the best ones to use, but I think things that we thought about were myths in a way that were going to come true at some point. It, a, a myth may mean, I mean, it can be used for the opposite. Oh, it's a myth that it, it, it may not be a reality. I don't know. It's just it, it, I was just thinking about that. Some I, mean, I can't think of another example, but um, that everybody is divine love. Is that real? Is that sacred? And or is it a myth? I don't know. 
I mean, when I see some behaviors, mm -hmm. I start to wonder, is there really divine love there? Clean coal is a myth. Clean coal. Clean coal. It's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's true. It's like the word has two different yeah. uses. Yeah. It has two different yeah. uses of the word myth. That's true. Yeah, that's, that's true. I, I, myth is story or myth is misunderstanding. Yeah, it's myth like understanding. something that's false. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's two different meanings. So it's two different meanings, yeah. but it's the same word. Yes. Yeah. Because we have an We do that a lot in English. But, yeah, but I think that, but I, my first thought of it was that myth is a, a more concrete story that, that is a way of um, making a more abstract <coughs> sacredness yeah. understandable. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. That's, What do you think? Uh, yeah, I was thinking of the same thing. I think of myth as truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, telling, uh, our, uh, yeah, telling stories and to, uh, show principles of morality, um, our relationship to God, mm -hmm. and uh, all told, you know, not in theological terms, but in terms of a story. Mm -hmm. So the story is true and in, uh, in effect. I mean, it, it's true, but I mean, it's not uh, an exact representation of any particular happening. It's just a made-up thing. It said it it, uh, it didn't happen exactly like this, but something like this story. Right. You know. There's a generalization there. You're right. right. Yeah. Universal mm -hmm. theme. Right. right. The characterization may not matter much, but the big picture does. Mm -hmm. The end, the end, and the start may may matter more. I thought it would occur in myth, possibly. Mm -hmm. That if you, in, in a Western, traditional Western society, if you have enough money, enough material things, enough education, yeah. blah, 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 you're going to be happy. Well, that's not really a myth, myth. That's no. a small myth. It's yeah. a little myth. Yeah. <laughs> it's a belief system. That's a belief, yeah. Yeah. That's a good luck with that. I think there is a difference between a belief and a myth. That's yeah. True. yeah. That's true. That's probably true. All right. What would you like to add? Yeah, so I'm getting, yeah, so I'm getting you want to talk about the first definition, not the second one. Well, the second one being like a falsity. You yeah, know, right. right. Mm -hmm. But False belief. False the, uh, the first one um, where you want um, my thoughts on the relation between myth and sacred, I think that um, very much what you guys were saying, um, myth is kind of like the encyclopedia for the sacred. Um, So the myth is the way that the sacred is um, kind of transported through through generations. I think if there's something um, that is a universal truth or a universal piece of wisdom or something that is is sacred to us humans in some way. We create a myth around it. I mean, I think traditionally before there was writing, that was the way we kind of carried knowledge forward and wisdom mm -hmm. forward from generation to generation. We created a, you know, like a myth or a fairy story around it. And that was kind of the encyclopedia for that sacred bit of wisdom or that sacred bit of truth that we wanted to keep alive mm -hmm. in the story, in the myth. Yeah. In the, on the caves, typically what you're talking about are, are pictures. Well, Originally, stories or pictures of animals or something. It can be pictures, I was thinking more mm -hmm. like um, fairy stories, okay. you know, that are taking a, a, a piece of classic wisdom, you know, kind of like mm -hmm. we were saying, there's the Odyssey, there's the hero's journey, you know, the old Joseph Campbell thing, mm -hmm. a way of, like you a know, fable. that's something that is... <clears throat> Um, independent of time, independent of the generation, true, you know, so the hero's journey being a myth about, you know, almost leads to alchemy, but if you apply that to the human transformation of, you know, someone, you know, going on that hero's journey and they're transformed as a, you know, da, 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 da. but the myth is the picture that explains to them what that hero's journey is and can kind of give them guidance or information as to what's happening to them and and why it's important, and so on and so forth. That doesn't change throughout the generations. That can be carried in the story. It might be carried in the painting as well. True enough. Good. Um, 
I had some thoughts, and they're not, they're probably not right there now, except that I was thinking there's some myths that seem to be attempts to answer the big questions, like how did we get here, where did it come from, who are we, and that sort of thing. And I think those are the early ones. And the thought occurred that um, some myths seem to be linked to probably the way it might have happened. In other words, the, the ancient Hindu uh, Vedas allude to like the Big Bang and the way evolution happened. And then some of the early other myths of other cultures are pretty much like, well, rabbit did it, or turtle, or, you know, and it's beautiful. But it's probably not the way it actually happened. I don't think that rabbit was the creator, or turtle, or, or whatever. <laughs> um, so I think there are attempts to explain, but I think myths have the ability to change consciousness. If you accept a certain myth as your reality, you're going to have a certain thought about things. And if you have a different myth, you're going to have a whole different perspective. So they're very, very powerful, I think. And um, mm -hmm. we're not to be taken lightly, because they can be used as uh, power tools, too. Almost and like weapons. a blueprint. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, sure. OK, cool. And what do you got, sir? Um, well, at first I was thinking that a uh, myth is the way you'd explain to a child what uh, something uh, really means, and you'd tell it in a language that the child could understand. And so I think that that is a story that illustrates a great truth. I think we've got myths all over in our culture. I was thinking the other day about um, uh, the Star Spangled Banner. You know all the words to the Star Spangled Banner. They'll say, can you see by the dawn's early light? But so proudly we hailed the twilight's last flame. You know, that's getting into a particular kind of a truth that uh, seemed to be on people's minds about patriotism and being on one side and God is on our side. And uh, it, re it still moves me to <laughs> go through the words of the Star Spangled Banner, and yet that's 250 years ago kind of a story. You know, the other would be uh, Adam and Eve in the uh, garden telling about the creation. So you tell your child, well, it was kind of like this. It's this man and this woman were naked down in the garden. Parents know that's not really literally what was true, but they're trying to explain to the children that what happened and that uh, somehow somebody fell from grace and ate the apple and uh, up came an apple computer. Well, I mean, now we get into the computer age and they have a myth for that. But, uh, anyway, uh, I think myths are very important ways of uh, distilling the sacred in our, in our culture and I've given uh, just Primarily one example of that is the Star Spangled Banner. And, uh, I mean, people go to Facebook and put their hands over their hearts when they do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, this then is my uh, active research model. Uh, oh, yeah, but what is a current myth? I'm really having a hard time thinking of current oh, myths. Oh, well, you'll, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, they're on my website. You can go read them. Oh, all right. <laughs> they're, again, they're based on nature or a nature theme or a nature struggle, mm. extinction of a species, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or I wrote a myth about the permaculture king who lives over in a hut by the school and teaches kids about permaculture. So, you know, I'm stretching it. I'm stretching it for a point. And the point is to find a consciousness shift on the planet and give people some tools to look at some sort of global change. Because in my opinion, after the crash, we're going to be in big trouble if we don't have another model or a system mm. based on permaculture.